Good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, which side of the country you're on. I want to welcome you to our, uh, our webinar here in June, Cecil McQueen Action Plan. Really excited to have everyone on uh, with us today. Uh, i got a great group of people signing in. I'm joining here from our world headquarters in Clawson, Michigan. So thank you very much for joining us. Next slide, Jim. I'm uh, Charlie McQueen, president of McQueen Financial Advisors. I have the, the fortunate uh, job of, of working with a bunch of wonderful people in our, our three main disciplines. Uh, we have our, our investment advisory team, or a fixed income investment advisor, we're managing bond portfolios and alternative portfolios. Uh, we also have our, our, our second grouping, which is our asset liability management modeling team, a great group that's doing all sorts of reporting, prepayment speeds, core deposit studies, and regular ALM reporting and, and, and executive level and, and dr director level and also examination level reporting. Also, our third grouping is our, our valuations team, which is all sorts of things. We're the pioneers of credit unions buying banks. We also do a lot of valuation work in credit union mergers, mortgage servicing rights, uh, fair value, and CECL. And so that's what brings us here today. Next slide, please, please Jim. I have with me uh, Jim Craven. I'm really excited to have Jim as a, a co-presenter today, or actually as a primary presenter. I'm, I'm here hanging out with him for a little bit. Uh, Jim is uh, responsible for Cecil. He's got a whole bunch of other titles here too, but he's our, our Cecil man and uh, been working on, on our model and uh, running it forward in implementation. So we're really excited to have Jim with us. Jim has been a, a longstanding, uh, great component of McQueen Financial Advisors and a lot of history in building models and, and giving great advice to clients. So thank you very much, Jim, for joining us today. Uh, next slide here is um, a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, if you have questions, move your mouse around your screen. You'll see the Q&A button pop up. Uh, feel free to submit your question. I'll be reading them. Uh, I'll either interrupt Jim uh, along the way or we'll give them to him at the end and uh, make sure that it makes sense. Uh, so please feel free to ask any question you want along the way. Also, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available for you. Please reach out to your McQueen Financial Advisor. Your advisor will be able to give you a link and get you a copy of the uh, presentation. So with that, uh, we have a short list of uh, agenda today. We're going to do uh, an economic update. Uh, it's, we need to start with a good spot for Cecil and understand where we are for Cecil and a little bit of the ramification. Uh, definitely an interesting world we're in today. Then we're going to get into Cecil, current expected credit loss, and we're going to spend the vast majority of our time there today. And then we'll have some time at the end again for questions and answers. So again, please feel free to ask them throughout the webinar or at the end. So thank you very much. All right. Well, I think as we look at this wonderful place we're in, uh, this really explains probably 90% of everything. Uh, this is M2 money supply. We have had five years of growth of money supply in the past year. Uh, we have clients coming to us talking about 10% deposit growth per quarter for the past four quarters. Amazing amounts of deposit growth that resulted from the cash being put into the system uh, by the United States federal government. Now, uh, this cash has lots of unintended consequences, uh, lots of positives, some definite challenges, uh, but this huge amount of cash coming in is stressing all sorts of capital ratios. Uh, it's also causing earnings to decline in a lot of ways unless you're participating in some of the unique earning things, such as um, looking at some non-interest income things from PPP loans or even into um, gain on sale of mortgages. So it's definitely making margin type business tougher we expect that to stick around for a while. This, this bump up of cash doesn't go away. It stays, as you can see back going here, back until the 1980s, uh, just keeps growing. And so it's something that's here to stay and it's gonna stick with us for a while. Now it's interesting, on the next page here, uh, this is a graph I haven't used in a long time, those of you that follow us here. Why, why are we talking about auto sales? Well, I think this is a great example. Uh, we had a really good economy going and then, then we had this little you know, pandemic hit. Um, COVID slowed stuff down, but not nearly as much as what people expected. You know, effectively stopped for a month, two months, month and a half, but then everything came back. Everything came back more than full speed. So we did have this big drop, but we came roaring back. And a lot of it is because of the cash that's been put into this market by the federal government, the, the continual stimulus payments and enhanced unemployment benefits we'll talk about. Um, but what's happened here is now we have massive supply chain problems. Every country is dealing with COVID a little bit different. Other countries are having significant problems right now. 
and we're seeing supply chain be an absolute mess, which is causing things for uh, inventory turnover is getting really fast and availability of cars is getting really low. Next slide, please, Jim. So one of my best indicators of how an economy is going is looking at the price of oil. And we have two things that affect the price of oil. One is the basic supply and demand, which we're seeing everywhere. Lots of supply and demand issues. But at the same point, there can be a component of, of public policy, really, of trying to get rid of oil. And we had some public policy against oil back in the you know, 10 years ago, eight, eight years ago. Uh, now we're into a spot, though, after we've been through a number of years of, of public policy that's been for more normalized oil, it appears to be mostly supply and demand issue. But that economy's run back lots of cash in there from the government, and we definitely see things going well. Now, I mentioned unemployment, and uh, here, here's the biggest thing. Um, we are really basically back to pre-pandemic levels and an unemployment percentage. We look here, for example, the state of Michigan at 4.9, the United States at 6.1. Um, you know, it's really interesting to me. This, this chart looks great except for the purple line. And the purple line is the length of unemployment. We're now up to 28.8 weeks, the very far top right. Um, that is a problem. And the length of unemployment is a problem. Um, everywhere I go, every business I go, uh, from a McDonald's to a, a, a nice restaurant, from a store, uh, a home improvement store to a home goods store. Everywhere I go, there's help wanted signs. Number of businesses, such as one of my favorite pizza restaurants, they tried to open up for in restaurant service. They want to. It's not a COVID issue. They just can't get employees. And so they're, they're, they can't get people to even put applications in. And so they're really struggling. So we're seeing this across the, every business, not enough people wanting to work. And so one of the things we hope that happens here is that the government will stop de incentivizing people to work. And we get people uh, off of the unemployment rolls to the, the highest level ever of open jobs or jolt number that just came out this last week. So definitely some headwinds there, which are causing a little bit of inflationary concerns. Next page, Jim. So another component that's added a little bit of inflationary concerns, but is also a part of the response to COVID is home prices. Home prices are doing great. People are looking for getting out of apartments. Uh, millennials are net buyers of homes in a big number right now. Home values are doing well. People want home offices. A lot of modifications and really low mortgage rates have helped propel this number. As we go to the next page, gross domestic product. This is another chart that really explains how strong of economy we're in. You see where we fell off the cliff, negative 34% GDP, positive 34% GDP, now positive 5, 5 6.5, 6.4 6 as of today. Wonderful, wonderful growth. We haven't seen this kind of positive GDP growth, and a lot of this relates to the amount of cash that's been thrown in the market. And on the next slide, you'll see the stock market is showing the exact same thing, too. What happens when you give a whole bunch of people a lot of money and lock them at home? They tend to invest. And so we're seeing massive amounts of investing, meme stop investing, regular stock investing. It's all pulling into the stock market, which are reaching record highs one more time. So with that, the next slide here is inflation. This is one of our obviously biggest concerns and one of the big concerns you're gonna see in the, the nightly news every night or online. Um, what we're seeing here is the consumer price index, X food and energy is at 3%, PCE is at 3%, consumer price index, including food and energy is 4.2. Really, really big numbers, especially on the X food and energy. Um, you know, This is something where we are seeing where values and prices fell. Now they're coming back up. That's some of it, but also it's just raw, raw supply and demand. There's more demand for things, and we have massive supply chain issues. The Fed is telling us today they think the supply chain issues will be fixed and life will be good. That is the one outstanding thing here. Um, but do remember, as food prices go up and energy prices go up, people's disposable income goes down, and we can see that that would actually slow the economy. So uh, the, the final number is still out in inflation here, but it's definitely uh, getting a lot of attention at this point, something we're paying close attention to. So the yield curve, where are we going from here? Well, I think this is a, a great comparison. Today's yield curve is basically the same of December of 2012. Well, why, why is that and what does that mean? Well, if we go to the next slide, it shows the history of the yield curve as we go through our time. One of my favorite graphs here, I know a number of you have seen, Fed funds rate in red, 10-year treasury, the black dotted line, the two-year treasury is the blue line. If we look at 2012, a lot of people, not us, we, we kept saying rates are going to be low for a long time. If you remember back in 2012, uh, we predicted a 10-year problem starting in 2008. 
Well, it stuck out along. We did see rates still go up. We saw the 10-year Treasury go from you know, roughly 1.6% to 3 So it did increase, but then we didn't go much farther, and we had a slow, gradual increase. So we're predicting a lot of the same here. We're, we're beginning to see things look like just like they did in 2012. We predicted a five-year slowdown, uh, five-year time of low interest rates, excuse me, not a slowdown, low interest rates for five years. And so here we are in, in 2020. One, mid-2021, we've got about another three and a half years of low interest rates is what we expect. Does that mean the 10-year treasury can go to 3%? Absolutely. Does that mean the 10-year treasury might go back to one and a quarter? Absolutely. But in general, low interest rates for that foreseeable time. And for the next, I'd say roughly, you know, three, three and a half years. So with that, this is a great introduction to CISO. And the reason being is everything that's going on in the economy is actually causing really low levels of delinquency because so much money is given to people right now. Unemployment is basically open-ended in most states. And so we're seeing people do really well. And so if there's ever a time to implement CECL, this is probably one of the best times I could have dreamed up because having a lack of credit losses coming from a model that is really a one or year, one to two year type of, of losses, which is the current allowance for loan and lease loss, going to CECL, which is a lifetime, You'd rather do that at a really, really good economic environment or low losses. So with that, I'm really excited to hand the call off to Jim. Uh, Jim, again, our, our CECL expert. Thank you, Jim, for joining me. It's all yours. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, appreciate it. First of all, thanks to everyone for joining us today. We had over th almost 300 people sign up for the webinar, and we certainly appreciate that. We're already working with many of you for CECL, but uh, there's plenty of people on the call who uh, have not signed up yet. And what we've learned over the last couple of months is that there's many, many people who are still on the fence about CECL. They believe it's not going to happen. They believe it's going to be delayed and they're taking a wait and see approach. And we hope uh, today that in some way we can change your mind about that. So we have uh, three main points today. In the readiness section, we're going to cover the two most common questions that we hear all the time. We'll talk about the time timeline, the COVID impact, really lack of COVID impact and data needs. Uh, we'll see in the timeline section that there's, you know, some things that should have already been done uh, and you may not have uh, gotten to them yet. Under the message section, I'll cover a broad overview of available calculation methods, how CECL can be applied and also make some suggestions about methods that make sense for most non-complex institutions. Finally, there are certain challenges related to the lead up for CECL implementation, as well as some other post implementation challenges. Uh, and it is no mistake that data needs is listed as the third bullet point on each of these uh, sections. We're already working with uh, many clients across the country and we've seen some unique data challenges. So we'll talk quite a bit about that. Uh, first, the most common question we hear and uh, many comments, uh, will Cecil be delayed or canceled? I used to say, I don't believe it will be delayed. Now I'm definitively saying, you know, Cecil will not be delayed delayed, right? Uh, and we've many reasons uh, to think that, just a couple of them listed here. CECL really doesn't apply just to uh, banks and credit unions. It applies to any company that holds financial assets. This is accounting guidance, not regulatory guidance. If this were regulatory guidance, your regulator might be able to delay it or, you know, get you exempt. But this is, uh, you know, regulators uh, cannot stop accounting guidance. And we're also not aware of any other accounting guidance that differs based on the type of company, you know, size, market focus or whatnot. So CECL will not be delayed and we will not be exempt from it. The next most common question is whether or not we should try to tackle this in-house or whether we should use an outsource model like McQueen's. Uh, and, you know, there are pros and cons, I suppose, for each. Uh, in, if we choose an in-house model, we, of course, have the challenge of creating a model, right? Somebody has to do the math behind it. We also believe uh, with near certainty that if you develop a model in-house, uh, that along the way, uh, an um, examiner is going to ask you for a validation of that model, right? They're not going to trust the math within your model. They're going to want to have a third party look at it, right? So, sort of like a ALM validation. We think there will be a requirement for CISO validations. We've 
also got ongoing ma maintenance uh, needs and just allocation of your time. If you choose an outsourced solution like McQueen's, um, you of course have a team of experts that are working on this. I have been doing um, you know, exclusively CECL work for a little over two years. Uh, we can help choose model methods. We can help build the assumptions within the model and so on. But there's also lots of benefits uh, to be had that are not necessarily in the printed report. We could certainly do peer analysis against um, institutions of a similar size, market focus or location. Uh, we will talk about examiner expectations with you from what we see from our other clients. Um, we can do some scenario analysis, like how will things look in the future based on you know a number of possible outcomes. We also, just like if you are currently an ALM client or uh, investment client, merger client, you know, any of those kinds of things, you know that we have lots of people around here who get exposure to lots of things and we learn things along the way and we can share them with you either, e either to answer questions for your auditors or, or examiners. And one of the biggest reasons to team up with a third party provider is interpretation of the results. If you're doing it in house, you know, you've got rely on you know a thorough knowledge of the model uh, and what it all means and if you're dealing with an outsourced solution of course you'll have a partner to do that for you so readiness the timeline the timeline is the first call report of 23 every single person on this call has the same implementation date uh, let's call at the end of 22 as a practical matter but we'll have to report our Cecil number for the first call report of 23 uh, on our readiness timeline, we've got a few bullet points at the top of things that you know should probably already be done. Some of them should certainly be done. Some of them should probably be done. Uh, and there's a, you know a number of key steps there. One of the big ones is deciding on an internal versus an external model, which we just talked about. And then there's lots of you know bullet points in there about um, you know data segmentation and so on. We're going to be talking about several of those things. Under um, 2021, you know we're halfway through this year practically. And on the uh, section for implementation steps on the right hand side, uh, we should be making a fine tuning adjustments to the model already. So if you're not signed up yet, you know, there's still quite a bit to do even to get ready to tackle these steps. Uh, the biggest one on here is uh, this idea of parallel model runs. We're already doing this for many, many clients whereby we are calculating a CECL number, you know, providing monthly CECL reports, and we are able to compare that to their current uh, amount and talk about the impact and uh, fine-tune model inputs and assumptions. This is extremely important. When we go live, of course, our CECL number is going to differ from our current allowance account, right? And uh, we want to know the impact of that. We know that we can spread it over three years, but we're going to want an early read on what the impact is going to be. Uh, so that's an important bullet point there. Uh, this slide is a repeat from a presentation I did a little over a year ago. And at that time, we, you know, in early 2020, we believed that COVID would result in considerable loan stress, but we don't believe that anymore. There was the, Charlie talked about it. There was a massive government response to COVID and we had, um, you know, stimulus packages, generous unemployment and so on. And the losses that we were expecting related to COVID really didn't happen. There was a fear early on that if we had a big spike up in losses uh, related to COVID in you know 2020 and 21, that we would have to carry those losses forward as a big percentage and then deal with them later when we went live for Cecil. Uh, but now it looks like that is largely behind us. If anything, we have seen that uh, losses are trending, you know, more favorable, you know, better conditions uh, based on everything that uh, Charlie and I just talked about. So we do not believe that COVID uh, will have a large impact on our CECL number, if at all. Uh, data needs under readiness. We need historical loan balance, historical charge offs, you know, losses, net of recoveries by segment. This has quite frankly been one of the biggest challenges that we face is collecting historical losses in CECL segments. One of the challenges, I'll just give a couple examples here, uh, but we have many challenges. We, we have some clients where historical losses are currently being tracked in very broad categories. 
meaning we have one category called real estate loans and another category called consumer loans. And the consumer loans includes uh, charge cards and cars and boats, indirect and direct lending, all sorts of things that have different risk characteristics. But they're all, you know, in the current method uh, and the history that's available to us, they have all been in one large segment called consumer loans. For Cecil, that is not going to work. We need segmentation that is based on loss characteristics. And we know that um, uh, secured versus unsecured loans have very different characteristics, very different loss patterns, and we need to have that history. It's been very challenging to get for some clients. Uh, in many cases, loan codes flip from whatever they were to you know 99 or some other code, and the original code is lost. So we might get a file that has uh, 10 years worth of losses in it, but all of the loan codes are 99. So it's impossible for us some sometimes to determine whether those were business loans, um, real estate loans, car loans, or whatnot. It's been a huge challenge. Uh, in a handful of instances, we have clients who track losses using a very detailed method, but recoveries are don't use the same method, right? So that has been a challenge with a handful of clients. So we encourage you know you to look at what you're doing there. Uh, we know we have lots of uh, uh, people on the call that are see you answers users, and I just have a very brief brief comment for you. We are already working with many clients who are CU Answers users and we have an automated data transfer of CU Answers data to McQueen that happens on the first of every month. We also have a discounted fee schedule for CU Answers users. So if that applies to you, we encourage you to reach out to us so we can describe it in more detail. There are many methods available to calculate CECL. And there are eight listed here. There may be more methods or fewer methods. And if you've attended any conferences or listened to other uh, presentations by other providers, you may have heard other terms for these exact methods, but they call them something else. Uh, this is part of the flexibility of CECL, right? It gives us ultimate flexibility to choose methods that are appropriate for us, right? For our complexity and the complexity of our loan pool. Uh, the one of the key issues here, though, is that with so many choices comes, you know, sort of uh, too many choices. There's no standard naming method. So you may see some names that are different uh, than these. And then the question comes, you know, how do we choose, right? And there's been lots written about this from um, FASB and from um, regulators. And I'll share a slide with you in just a moment. But the choices here are important. Some of these methods are very robust. They're more re robust than others. Some have predictive features, meaning they have a forward-looking component to them based on past patterns, right? And those may appeal to you, but they also may be very expensive and very data intensive if you want to implement them. So they're not appropriate for everybody. Uh, the question is, is CECL complex? If you look at that list of eight available options, you could easily see that, yes, yeah, CECL is complex, right? There's lots of choices for us, uh, but we don't need all of them. That, that That's one of the things that that um, I think is key for this discussion. For any of you that are current McQueen clients, you already know this. What we do, what we talk about a lot and what we act on a lot is this idea that we are going to take complexity away from you and give you the results give you interpretation of the results. Nobody wants complexity. Uh, everyone, everybody wants simplicity, and we will take that away and give you the results that you want uh, in a simplified form. Uh, question is, how are we going to do that? Uh, we're going to cover today the weighted average maturity method, right? Of, of those eight methods, this is one of uh, one of them. And this is, uh, you know, lots of other methods available. And uh, we know that we hear more about this method than any other. And it's our belief that it's appropriate for most institutions and most non-complex loan categories. Uh, FASB has published papers about this method and regulators have uh, jumped on the bandwagon and also commented on this. You don't have to take my word for it. 
uh, and th during a series of uh, webinars, uh, all of these uh, regulatory bodies got together. We've got the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, NCUA, FASB, and others all got together and did a series of webinars and papers about the uh, the method that we're talking about today, the weighted average maturity method. Uh, if you want the links for these discussions, um, I certainly have those available for anybody who would like to look at them. So we're going to go hey, Jim, through. Um, yes. I have a question. I want to just uh, pause for a second here. Um, uh, someone asked me a question. W will you run all the methods that a bank or credit union can use and then choose the appropriate one? Or are we going to go through a process of figuring out what is the best method and recommending it? How is that going to work? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, generally, we are focused on two of the available methods. I, I won't go back to that slide. It would take a while. And maybe this is a question we should address separately because it would take a little while. But okay. as a big picture statement, some of those methods require more data then we are going to have available to us, right? And we, in order to calculate some of these that have a predictive nature to them, we would have to look backwards, say, at loans that have, um, where we've had a charge off and look at every attribute that they had along the path leading to a loss, right? And then try to apply that as a predictive measure to other loans with similar characteristics along a path. Now, you, you can imagine that that's a huge uh, data intensive exercise and the data is generally not gonna be available. So we're gonna look, uh, we could look at multiple methods, probably not every one of them, simply because um, uh, the data won't likely exist for um, many of those methods. Yeah, so I think it's a fair point, Jim. I think uh, I'll answer it just a little differently than you is we're going to look at the data that you have available. We're going to look at the types of loans you have, uh, the complexity of, of your loan portfolio, and that will be actually a really good indicator of what is the best area for you to look at. So that's, that's the process that'll take, and um, it, it is, it's easier to select a methodology than what many would think uh, from the side point. Cool. Good point. And a great Thank question. You. A great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so this um, slide is just a broad overview of data analysis. We're going to go into each of these uh, points in greater detail um, later in the presentation. Um, loan segmentation, of course, we talked about that is critically important. Uh, and we'll talk about each of these um, in a moment. So this is part of a single sentence from FASB. Uh, an entity should aggregate financial assets on the basis of similar risk characteristics. That, you know, partial sentence, just, you know, simple statement has turned into a great deal of work, as you might imagine. Segmentation exercise um, starts us out looking at uh, the loan pool, both the history and current. Uh, what do we have and how should we uh, group loans together by similar risk characteristics? It is possible to get segments that are way too broad, right? We know that um, used indirect auto loans have a different loss pattern than new direct auto loans, right? So we would not want them combined into a single segment. And there are plenty of other examples of that where segmentation could be too broad. We also don't want segments that are too narrow, like what is shown on the right. If we have segments that are too narrow, the problem is, is that that small sample size uh, could create problems later. Let's say we had, um, you know, a, a category with five loans in it, right? And one of them had a significant loss. Well, that means that that loss as a percentage of that segment is going to be very large. And we would need to carry that forward within that segment and apply a uh, large reserve for the rest of it over the life of the remaining life of those loans. So we need to be very careful here about segmentation. Um, uh, this method, we're going to talk about weighted average maturity method. I said we we're going to simplify things. Uh, broad overview here. To, let's not make it any more complicated than we have to. We need three things to calculate a CECL number using the weighted average maturity method. Historical losses, which we generally get from our client. We are working on methods to get them from call report data. Then we need what are called current condition adjustments. 
And those are just looking at whether or not the pool or the segments have, you know, changed. Has anything changed within these segments that would lead us to believe that losses are going to improve or deteriorate going forward? That's current condition adjustment, step two of CECL. Step three is forecast adjustments. This is looking outside. Are there any economic conditions that would lead us to believe that losses calculated in step one are going to be different uh, going forward based on economic conditions? So three steps to CECL. Step one, we'll go into a little bit more detail. Historical losses. Very important that we start gathering data now. I talked about that on another uh, slide. Uh, and we think that um, you know, data that you collect should be very specific. One of the challenges uh, we've already seen is that um, some clients, the data that they give us does not match call report data. And we um, believe that uh, examiners will eventually compare these things, right? They may be looking at um, call report data and CECL reports and expect that they match up very closely. And uh, we are working on a method um, to uh, do those things uh, so we can reconcile uh, potential differences. That is step one of CECL. We're going to collect historical losses by segment. It seems like a simple process, but it has uh, proven to be quite challenging. Step two is current condition adjustments. Now, again, current condition adjustments is simply looking at anything in the loan pool. You know, we're looking at data for this mostly, but is there anything going on in the loan pool that would lead us to believe that some trend is either uh, indicating that losses will improve or deteriorate going forward? We think delinquency is the best indicator of portfolio condition, although we are measuring um, current condition adjustments using a variety of methods, not just delinquency. Our model has, uh, you know, six or seven of them. So we have this information for most uh, clients from ALM reports. Now, one of the challenges we found here is that some off-system loans like credit cards or if you have, you know, off-system mortgages or participation loans, the files that we get for them, you know, may not have the same level of detail that we can get from our on-system loans. And that has been a challenge for us. Uh, but current condition adjustments generally come out of the uh, loan file, but we also can look at current condition adjustments uh, for other reasons. If the largest employer in your footprint shut down, right, and you've got a lot of, you know, borrowers that uh, work for that company, right, we may have a current condition adjustment, uh, you know, adjust our number higher based on those kind of local or regional, uh, regional activities. Uh, step three is forecast adjustments. We have been publishing a, an economic forecast for nearly 20 years that are industry specific and, you know, may be difficult to retrieve it from other sources. We look at all kinds of things and uh, we really have uh, honed in on the idea that the unemployment rate has the largest correlation between industry-wide losses, you know, versus other uh, values, inflation or other factors. We are looking at many things, but uh, unemployment rate uh, seems to be the best indicator of, um, of uh, losses. So now we're all going to get into our Cecil time machine. And let's imagine that today is the day before implementation. It's December 31st of 2022. And uh, as we look at the next several slides, when we see, you know, dates that are 21 and 22, it's, we're, remember, we're fast forward. So this information at the bottom left of this graph is history at this point. So again, step one of CECL, historical losses. Here we have uh, annual loss rates calculated, and these are all from our history, and we have an average of them. See, it ramped up, it uh, came back down sharply, and our average over this six-year period has been 35 basis points. Again, step one of CECL. Step two is looking at the loan pool and seeing if there's any condition that has changed that would lead us to believe that losses are gonna differ going forward. This could be credit scores, it could be delinquency status, collateral value, you know, underwriting standards, you know, something local uh, to your footprint. It could be all kinds of things uh, that are included in our model. Today, just for this discussion, uh, we're gonna look at the current condition adjustment for the percentage of loans that are 60 days 
days or more delinquent. So we look at the trend of that. It's down this blue shaded band here. And we see that the trend, it ramped up here uh, quite sharply into 2020 and then has fallen uh, just as quickly. So now that we have a trend here, uh, our next step is to determine, you know, will that trend, is that trend likely to cause a change in our uh, charge-offs looking forward? And here we have choices. We can say if the trend indicates it, we can say, you know, losses are expected uh, higher and we would make a positive adjustment. If charge-offs are not expected to change based on this trend, uh, we would make no adjustment. And in the green section here, we see this trend is substantial improved. So in th for this example, we would make a negative adjustment because this uh, percentage of loans that are 60 days or more delinquent uh, has improved sharply over this recent period. That is step two, but again, this is not the only criteria we measure. Uh, we have seven or eight of them in our model. Some of them in the loan file and some of them are uh, based on discussions uh, with our client. Forecast adjustments are up next. Uh, we are using the um, uh, unemployment rate forecast uh, for this example, but many other things could be used. Uh, in this case, we have the unemployment rate, uh, again, ran up sharply trended back downwards. In this one, we also have a forecasted unemployment rate that we get out of the Federal Reserve. And this is step three of CECL. Uh, we see that the unemployment forecast has uh, been improving sharply as expected to improve even more. So same thing here. We've got a forecast adjustment that is negative based on improving unemployment rate. Again, lots of other ways we could measure this. We're showing the unemployment rate here uh, for this example. Now, pulling it all together, we have um, the calculations within the model. Uh, again, we're in our Cecil time machine. Today is the start date, which is the end of 22, start of 23. We have for this segment, 8.7 million in loans. We apply the historical loss rate of 35 basis points to the amortizing balance of uh, this loan segment. That gives us a lifetime projected loss rate of $62,000, 71 basis points. Our current condition adjustment is negative because the 60 day delinquency trend has been improving and our forecast adjustment is also negative uh, because the unemployment rate is improving. Now this slide, uh, has a lot of challenges on it. If examiners came in and they looked at this uh, information, they could ask lots of questions and we need to have the answers for those. Number one is when they see negative adjustments, after all, we're reducing the number here. Uh, we expect that they will hone in on those things and ask, well, why is this 10 basis points? Why is it negative? Why are some segments negative and some could be positive, some could be zero? They can ask lots of questions there. Uh, the forecast adjustments same thing. They could ask, why is it 15 basis points based on this unemployment forecast and not, you know, negative 10 or five or some other number? And now I'm not suggesting that we have all the answers yet, but we are collecting lost data, uh, delinquency data, unemployment and so on uh, from all over the country for our clients. And over time, we'll be able to make relationships between these numbers so that when we see uh, any trend, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, we'll be able to relate that to losses and carry that over into our other clients. It's one of the things that, one of the benefits that you won't have if you choose an in-house model. Now, once we get to that point, uh, there's all kinds of adjustments that need to be made. We, it was surprised me. We have lots and lots of clients where they have full on segments with no losses, right? A lot of uh, loan categories, especially uh, business lending, uh, commercial lending, uh, real estate lending. We have many clients who haven't had a loss in, you know, maybe five, 10, or even 15 years. We also have other clients where they might've had a loss last year, no losses the prior two years, and maybe a loss the, you know, three or four years back, right? Um, so there's all kinds of reasons we might need to make an adjustment to these numbers um, based on whatever the, whatever trend shows in the data. Um, TDRs are also added to the model or other known losses like known bankruptcies, those kinds of things. 
Uh, one of the big challenges uh, for examiners and, you know, when we get our exam is this term reasonable and, and supportable. It's, it's, it's listed throughout regulatory guidance. And for those of you, again, who are McQueen clients for any service, you already know that we uh, have, uh, you know, lots of field experience in, you know, variety of things. And we all get asked questions every day. We share them with each other, you know, during weekly meetings. And so everybody on our team gets a broad sense of what's going on and how to support model choices, how to uh, respond to examiners and so on. Uh, just a couple points here about what um, examiners may focus on. So uh, the, the discussion today was largely around our full Cecil turnkey service, right? We certainly offer that. But for those of you who are have already chosen other models or if you develop an in-house model, we just want to make you aware that we have, uh, you know, a variety of other services available from policy development. You know, we can help with uh, loss tracking, loan segmentation, and a variety of other things. We do believe this last bullet point is extremely important. Uh, over time, just like you might be asked to do an AL ALM validation of your ALM model. We think um, that there's going to be a need for CECL validations, especially if you develop your own in-house model. Examiners are very likely to say, look, we want a third-party review of your math and of your methods and of your choices within the model. And we think that that, although we have no experience with it yet, right, because nobody has not largely implemented the big the big banks have implemented and a handful of others. But when we are all in the after implementation, maybe a couple years down the road, uh, we think there's going to be a huge need for a third party review of policies, model use, you know, math, uh, assumption review, and so on. And we will certainly offer those services. So uh, big takeaways from today's discussion. Three key points. Uh, Cecil is not going away. Right, it will be implemented on schedule, and we should already be started. There's plenty of things that uh, we should have already done, and if we haven't, we need to get going pretty quickly. Uh, we've got uh, lots of people signed up here, and I'm guessing that many of you are on the fence. There are many reasons to get signed up uh, literally right now, June. Uh, would not be too soon, right? We have lots of clients that were onboarding in June, more in September. And I think we already have some people signed up uh, for implementation or not implementation for, um, you know, to start uh, working with them at the end of December. This gives us the opportunity to do a full year of parallel model runs so we can compare to your current method uh, to fine tune model inputs and to gauge the impact. Uh, if you're on the fence, we would encourage you to talk to us uh, right now. Um, you know, as a little heads up, we do anticipate we're going to have lots of people sign up for, you know, to start in December so they have a full year ahead of them. Uh, for those of you on the call who have the ability and desire to sign up earlier than that, we would highly encourage you to do that. We could start for June, we could start for September, and there's plenty of reasons to get started a little bit early to get in front of what we think is going to be a lot of people signing up for December. Uh, and as a third, you know, primary point, um, we know that CECL implementation, you know, ongoing reporting, support, um, you know, writing written rationale for model choices, dealing with examiners, there's many, many challenges that we are all about to face. And, um, you know, just as a last point, we are certainly available and ready to help you with those challenges. So uh, thanks for the one question, but um, we um, we've got a bunch more have here. Time Jim. for more yeah. questions, yeah. yeah. We got a lot, uh, so oh, good. if you want to feel free to add them, but I got a bunch here in the queue for you. Go right um, ahead. I'll, I'm going to answer the first one, so I'll give you a chance to get a drink of water there. Yeah, my voice um, is running out here. Yeah, in a different webinar last month, someone said they indicated that the warm method isn't recommended any longer because it it's too close to a double triple L and simplistic do we have any thoughts on that and you know um, i actually looked this up i heard a rumor about this a couple of days ago and went to the fasb website and went to a bunch of other the accounting statement set, set websites and they're still recommending uh the warm method and so i think that where this can be it's all about the complexity uh, jp morgan is not going to be using the warm model based off the type of lending they do most community financial institutions warm model is a very good solution 
And so it all depends on the complexity of what you're doing. So I uh, just want to break that out there. We, we've heard a couple of rumblings about that, but we are seeing a ton of people implementing the, the warm methodology across, across the universe right now. All right. So another great question came in. Um, so we'll start with the June 30th, 2021 loan portfolio, for example. How far back will we have to provide loss information to start working from there? Uh, great question. Uh, the best loss data that we have, uh, we analyzed just yesterday, and we have a full 10 years worth of data. Uh, we don't need that much, though. Let's say you signed up for June 30th, and you were unable to give us any loss data. We're going we're gonna to think about extremes here because that helps us understand, you know, everything in between. We have somebody with 10 years of great loss data. Let's say you signed up in June for June uh, uh, start date and you had none. If you have no loss data right now or we can't interpret what you do have, we're going to have 18 months worth when we start. Right. And then we're going to, because we'll start with June, we'll have the rest of 21, we'll have all of 22, we'll have 18 months worth. If that's all we have, then that's what we're going to use. The Cecil standard is very clear on this particular point. That is, we don't have to spend a bunch of time and a bunch of money going to get something that we don't have. Over time, you know, would we ideally like to have more data than that? Of course we would, you know, more lost data. But if we only had 18 months, well, that means when we go live, you know, we'll have a little bit of data, but a year down the road, we'll have, you know, two and a half years and then three and a half right. years and it'll yeah. just build from there. So, so a perfect world, we'd like three, four or five years worth of data yeah. if we can have it. If we can't, we'll, we'll work through it. I think that's yeah, the best exactly. answer to that. So, okay. Uh, another question came in from uh, Jenny in terms of segmentation. Based on your comments, would you advise us now to attempt to build segments consistent with call report breakdowns? Um, I would say no. And the reason, two reasons, if we think about um, the way that uh, uh, call report data is, um, we would have for real estate loans, we might have HELOCs and home equity loans combined together there. Uh, and that might be a challenge. Now we could make some relationships and potentially use it, but the other uh, challenge that's probably uh, a little bit bigger is on what the, uh, uh, the category for the call remor report might be something they call other loans or all other loans, I think they call it. That segment, is going to, and this is for the NCUA, there may be a similar segment for the FDIC, but that segment is going to have charge cards and direct, uh, or excuse me, uh, un unsecured loans, secured loans, you know, all sorts of things in it with different risk characteristics. So if you go down that path, you should also be prepared to look at some relationships based on loss data so that you separate it a little bit finer than what the exactly the call report says. Yeah, so there's, there's just, I think, making sure your segmentation is reasonable is probably the uh, simple way to put this. And, and uh, I do like call report level, but at the same point, you've got to make sure you're not mixing risks uh, too dynamically. So, all right. Uh, next question came in here uh, from Tom. Great question. We did cover this, I think a little bit, but I want to repeat it because uh, I, I think this is a very, very valid question today. If a credit union has not experienced any uh, delinquency or charge offs with the loan segment, you know, uh, over the past X number of years, how is it going to handle this? Do, do, is there a minimum? What, what happens? Yep. Uh, great question. We are already, we have already uh, tackled that largely. Um, and let's take real estate lending as an example. Over the last 20 years, uh, industry <clears throat> charge offs have been six basis points. The worst year was 39 basis points, and that was in about 2008, 2009, and the last five years have been one basis point. If yours have been zero for 20 years, then the question is, what's the right number? Well, it's not zero. Examiners will not allow you to look forward over the amortizing life of your loan pool and predict zero losses. So the answer is it's between somewhere between one and six. It's certainly not as high as 39, but we're going to be using industry data to set a floor 
for where you for segments where you have no losses. And we're going to do it for multiple segments because we have multiple clients that have had zero losses on, say, new car loans, right? Which I didn't think would be possible, but it is possible. Yeah. So I think the, the answer is, is that this is a very tough one to answer because a number is not the correct answer and zero is not the correct answer because the expectation is likelihood of a loss at some point. So that's going to be really based off of some of your local data. Definitely interesting. Um, all right. Next question um, came in here. I'll answer this one, Jim. You have a sip of water. Uh, Chuck, I, I love the question that you're using a, a local unemployment rate and and, and I love that. And um, and you're asking if there are, are forecasts available for those, and there are not that we know of. Uh, we've not seen any local unemployment forecasts. Uh, there's just some Federal Federal Reserve giving their national unemployment forecasts. Uh, local is good. Uh, it's a great way to look at it, and uh, it's going to affect your group very closely. So none that we know of. All right. Um, next question. Will a CECL policy replace our ALLL policy? Yes. There we go. <laughs> like it. Simple, simple answer. All right. On to the next question. Um, uh, why I understand that each financial institution is unique. As you work with clients on parallel runs, what types of impact to capital are you seeing on average? Uh, can the capital hit be spread out in 2023? So, I'll take a little stab at this and Jim can correct me. Uh, the short version is, is, is we've seen people, and it, it also depends, very unique as your statements there. Some people it's doubled and some people it's tripled and some people it's been one and a half times. That's effectively the range from one and a half to three times that I've seen. Jim, have you seen anything different there? Well, yeah, I have. And it really depends on whether or not you uh, early on you set aside uh, money for potential COVID losses. Some of our clients are, when we calculate their initial CECL number, it's lower than their current reserve amount because they set aside way more money than they would have possibly needed for potential COVID losses, right? But as a big picture statement, um, we should intuitively think that the CECL number should be higher than our current reserve account, right? How much higher really depends on so many variables. We have seen in the range of, you know, 30% higher is, you know, quite common. If it's double or triple, well, certainly if it's triple, um, we should um, be prepared to look very closely at what's going on in the model because we might have missed something, right? Uh, that would be out of the range that we expect. And then the other part of the question was, uh, yes, we are, uh, we can spread the impact over three years. And I believe that's optional. Um, somebody asked me recently whether or not they could do it immediately if they wanted to. And I told them to ask their auditor, but I believe that's optional. But you do have, you can spread it over three years. Yep, that is, you can spread over to three years. So thank you very much. All right, another question that came in. Um, how much work do we need to do with CECL with held to maturity securities and any other asset? And Rick, I love this question. Uh, securities that are held to maturity that have a credit component will have to be implemented for CECL. And this is part of what we're offering to our clients. Uh, what you're going to have to do is, is have a credit reserve for a held to maturity security that has credit component to it, such as a corporate bond or a municipal bond. A uh, reason why it's only held to maturity is well, you're not marking those to market. And so we're looking for if there's any potential uh, problem and that we're setting money aside. A bond that is available for sale, uh, the, the market expects that the market is taking into account any credit concerns and would reduce the price. So there definitely is going to be uh, concerns and work done there. Uh, and that would be the only other asset that needs to be dealt with with CECL appropriately. All right, next question, Jim. Um, uh, can we choose different CECL methodologies for different segments based on the characteristics and data available? That's perfectly acceptable. Yes, we can. Um, uh, auto loans is a good example. We have a client that we're working with where, you know, we're looking at auto loans because uh, typically charge offs don't happen 
early on on auto loans, right? They happen in the after 18 months, 30 months, you know, in that range. So brand new auto loans don't have a, a great risk of charge off and neither do very aged auto loans. So we're using the vintage method for that. So yes, uh, yes. And it, it really, as Charlie mentioned earlier as well, it's um, data dependent as well. It, it takes it takes probably at least 10 years worth of data to uh, use the vintage method. Um, and that's on loans that are generally five years long. We need to go back 10 years. Um, and if the data is available, we can certainly do that. But other methods may need more data. And it just depends on whether or not it exists or not. Okay, wonderful. Um, all right, next question for you. How do you determine the appropriate basis point adjustment needed for relevant QE factors? How are these adjustments documented and justified as the proper level? Yeah, great question. This is the big unknown that I mentioned when uh, I said that examiners would start asking these questions, right? Re uh, the guidance is relatively clear here. The first exam after you go live, examiners are gonna make sure you have, you know, some CECL approved method, right? And you're calculating it. But the second exam, they can start asking you questions exactly like that. You know, why did you use 15 basis points instead of 10 or 12 or some other number? And, it, I'm not suggesting that we currently have all the answers for that, but we uh, are collecting data in our database. Uh, we already have millions and millions of data points from clients all over the country. And these are relationships that we are going to be able to measure. So if we see a trend of the uh, delinquency rate, you know, trending sky high, we're going to be able to look at, you know, when that has happened to other clients and what it meant to losses and uh, hone in on the correct number there, right? That's uh, uh, our plan for handling that. And we'll be able to, it already exists for the unemployment rate, right? We already know in our model, it's, it's uh, two pages are dedicated to it. We know how the changes in the unemployment rate impact um, industry-wide losses, right? That's already part of the model, but we're also going to do that for various other things in the in the current condition, right? The, the ones that'll be really challenging is let's say that the largest employer in your footprint shuts down, right? Well, we're that's a one-off, right? And we're going to have to talk to you about what that means to us and how to handle it within the model. Jim, another question that came in, um, and it relates to uh, loan participations. So a credit union in Michigan that is uh, doing a loan participation uh, based out of California, and they bought a bunch of loans in California. Does this, does this, complex, this, does this add complexity to the whole CECL process? Uh, it could. Um, if you think about the the three parts of Cecil, the first part is historical losses. It's, uh, you know, where the loans are located shouldn't matter there. The second part is um, current condition adjustments. We're going to be looking at things like the delinquency trend and so on. We can measure that no matter where the loan is. The challenge would be, and we can, this, we can accommodate this in the model as well. Let's say that all of these loans are in California. You're in Michigan, right? And so the California... Um, you know, employment situation is vastly different than Michigan or the rest of the country or some, you know, stress hits that region. Um, it might not be um, something that we can point to and say that will result in 25 basis points more losses or something, but the model can certainly accommodate that. And if you have situations like that, we should at least consider it and talk about how we're going to handle it. But yeah, the, that's something that we should be thinking about. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate your answer there. Um, and a couple other things that came across, but I want to add a, answer a few questions that came from people. Uh, we'll be, if you'd like to get a copy of our fee schedule and uh, process, please reach out to your advisor. If you have asked, I'll reach out to you and provide that information to you uh, as we're running out of time now in the webinar. Um, so with, with one last question just came in, we'll answer this, then do a little wrap up. Uh, Jim, uh, coming here from, from Tom. <laughs> If I sign up on July 30th, when would I get my first report? Uh, yeah, this is uh, a lot of this is dependent on data, right? And uh, so some of this depends on you. If you have 
you know, seven off system loan files and your provider uh, can't get you meaningful files, right? Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer. But as a big picture statement, we're talking about six weeks to get your first report and then monthly thereafter. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We're going to wrap things up. As I know, most people are booked to hour to hour in meetings. So thank you very much for your time. We're really excited for Cecil. If anyone has any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Jim or myself. Uh, we do look forward to seeing all of you at our next economic update coming on August 11th. Uh, we're going to have an economic update for the second half of the year, or really fourth quarter of the year. And then after that, on October 20th, we have our industry update for budgeting and planning. So in the beginning or mid-October, late October, we're going to be talking about budgeting for, for the next year. With that, we'd like to thank everyone for the continued relationship. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you, Jim, for all your effort in CISO. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. And just one quick comment. Thanks again for everybody who joined us, especially the three people who have already emailed me and asked for additional information. I appreciate that. <laughs> thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone.